Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the Vantage Seminar. I'm very happy to uh, be here on this um, beautiful fall day. At least it's beautiful here in Colorado. And um, today, uh, today we um, are really fortunate to have David Roberts speaking. This is our last talk in the Bailey Maps and Hurwitz Spaces series of talks. And he'll be talking about Hurwitz Bailey Maps. Uh, and David, is it all right if we video this talk? Yes, that's fine. Oh, thanks so much. And yeah, go right ahead. Okay, well, thank you for inviting me to speak in this wonderful series. And I, I just seen a whole bunch of you enter, some of which I like really want to talk to. In fact, everyone I know I really want to talk to. I haven't seen some of you in quite a while. And some of you I haven't met. So I'm looking forward to meeting you, if not today, then in the future. All right, so Rachel asked me to talk in this um, sort of this unit of the Vantage series, which is about belly maps and Hurwitz spaces. So this is something I've done in the past, which sort of fits naturally into this, um, in, into this unit. But I, I do notice that the previous five talks were pretty much exclusively or almost at least on belly maps very little Hurwitz things. And so I've colored my talk in that way, that really what I'm doing is, is constructing interesting belly maps using the Hurwitz theory, which I'm gonna treat very lightly as, as input. Well, we have a technical problem just at the get-go. Sorry. This was uh, working. I think that's our fault. Sometimes when the presentation mode makes it tricky. Yeah. You to go into that. So, um, yeah, why don't you try hitting the minus button once? The minus button. Let's see if it works now. Thank you. So Drew, that was your much vaunted technical support. <laughs> but yeah. It, it worked. I say right. it works every time. All right. So this is my overview slide. And um, I'm fortunate to not have to give like traditional background on belly maps. My sort of five predecessors have done that, but I will give some background on belly maps sort of adapted very much to my context. And I will be giving this background with reference to one belly map. So like, if you don't know about belly maps, this is not gonna make sense. But if you pretty much know in general about belly maps, this is gonna make sense. So this particular belly map is going to have degree 64, relatively large, and monodromy group all of S64. I'll be reviewing some of that. Its field of definition will be the rational numbers, and its collection of bad primes will just be two, three. So these three things that I've just put up, monodromy groups, field of definition, and bad reduction, I'm sort of going to be considering them together often. I'm gonna be referring to them as like the big three. So that's gonna be like the first 15 or 20 minutes of my talk. And then the second 20 minutes will be about the conjecture, uh, a conjecture on the exist. So I'm trying to convince you in part one that this particular belly map is really cool. And so in part two, I'm gonna conjecture that similar belly maps exist in arbitrarily large degree. And then part three, so none of this, neither part one nor part two will make any reference to Hurwitz anything. And only in part three, I will explain how from the Hurwitz theory, you can construct these pretty extreme Babel maps. So I'll be giving very briefly the definition and then with some more detail, some numerical examples and trying to sketch how I think the conjecture is, is not unreasonably out of reach. It's possible to maybe even prove the conjecture with current technology. So Rachel actually asked me to talk on my work with Akshay Venkatesh, and um, that will be a key input for this talk. But in order to sort of move things over into belly maps, I need to put that a little bit to the side, and that's what I'll be doing. And just so you know, what I did with Akshay a while back was more centered on number fields, and this belly map case, which I'm talking about today, is um, it's more geometric. And that means that the conjecture is sort of, it, it seems more likely that the conjecture is provable. All right, section one. So let's think in general for just a little bit 
about general maps from let's say a connected algebraic curve down to P1. So <clears throat> they're, they're gonna be ramified somewhere, I mean, except for super silly examples. And, um, and the total number of critical points uh, is given by this famous Riemann Hurwitz formula. There it is, if you count multiplicity, which we always do. And just so you're not thinking too abstractly, I'm going to have five explicit examples today. And all of them, the upstairs curve will have genus zero. And moreover, all of them, I'll have a parameter over Q on the upstairs curve. So this capital F in my examples will just be a rational function in the sense that we teach in calculus or pre-calculus or something like that. So that's about the explicit examples. But you do need to keep in the back of your mind that general genus is allowed and the various theoretical considerations will require general genus. All right, so, so let's think about a, a generic map. So the critical points upstairs are typically distinct and the critical values downstairs, they're distinct also. So like what I have in mind is maybe a degree 100 polynomial like randomly chosen over another degree 100 polynomial randomly chosen. You take the derivative by the quotient rule, you'd have 198 roots of, of the numerator and those would probably all be distinct. That's your critical points. And you could run these roots through your function and you'd have 128 sort of Y values. That's how you might say it in calculus. And they'd probably all be distinct. That's what a generic map looks like. But Bailey maps are at the other extreme. So something, a function of this sort is called a Bailey map. If it's critical values, are all within zero, one, and infinity. So these are the downstairs points, points in P1. And I know that you have from the previous talks, many, a much deeper understanding of Bailey maps and lots of intuitions, but I just wanna emphasize this one point that Bailey maps are as far from generic as possible. And then secondarily, their, their three critical values are normalized to zero, one, and infinity. So, um, these three points naturally are going to be playing a pretty central role in um, everything that we do. And so I'm going to try to alert you to their presence by color. So things associated with zero, I will be coloring red systematically. Things associated with one, I hope you can see these colors nicely, um, uh, coloring in blue and, and things associated to infinity, I'll associate green with that. So remember section one, which I'm currently in, is focused on a single Bellu map. So let me give you the Bellu map. There it is. So remember, we're in this elementary context of actual rational functions. And it's certainly a rational function. And we can look at numerator and denominator degree, they're both 64, so it's a degree 64 rational function. But I, I haven't told you yet why it's a Bellu map. And more importantly, I haven't told you why you should get excited about this map. I think at the moment I've just, it looks like I've written down a rational function. Well, I, I have written down a rational function, but at the moment it looks like just some random rational function. So why is this one sort of particularly interesting? So first, the top has degree 64 and the bottom has degree 64, but moreover they're monic. And so that means, if you sort of translate what all this means, that infinity upstairs goes to one downstairs. All right, but if we're talking, if, we, if I wanna explain to you where the, why it's a Bellu map, I have to sort of find all of the twice the degree, so 128 <clears throat> plus twice the genus, that's zero minus two. So 100, I have to find all 126 critical points. So where are they? Well, most of them are obvious. So from the numerator, maybe we could focus right here. You can see my cursor, right? That's working nicely, right? Okay. So minus two, it's sort of multiplicity in the fiber above zero is nine. But when you count critical points, there's a derivative involved. It's natural to subtract one. So this minus two is a critical point of multiplicity eight contributing to this 126. 
And then we have, you know, a 17 plus two copies of 17 plus a zero. And so from the numerator, we have a 59 towards the 126. Same deal on the denominator. The arithmetic is easier. Four roots, each with multiplicity 16 in the fiber, each contributing 15 towards the different, so to say. So that's a 60. We have a little bit left. So now what's sort of the only thing sort of interesting on this slide is I'm not really showing you yet. If you, if you take the numerator and subtract off the denominator, well, I've commented that it's monic, so the degree is at most 63, but actually numbers have been contrived, so the degree is 56. And so that means infinity is a critical point with multiplicity seven. And if you add up all these numbers, you do get 126. So I don't need to look at any of the other fibers. Uh, they're all contain 64 separate points, so at least we have a bell you met. So if, if what you have under your belt is these last five weeks, then you can see it's a bell you map, but I really haven't explained why it's interesting. So that's the, the rest of, of section one here. So I just got out of three and a half consecutive hours teaching calculus, which, which is why I may be a little bit frazzled. Tuesdays is my hard day. And um, so how would a calculus student look at this? Well, they would graph it. And we might ask them like, where are the roots? Where are the vertical asymptotes? Where are the horizontal, right? All the standard questions. So what does it look like here? Well, there it is. I've graphed my degree 64 uh, rational function. It looks a little bit like what you see in a calculus class or a pre-calculus class, but it's so extreme that it doesn't look all that much like what you normally write down. So let's track through the things that we talked about on the previous slide with reference to this picture. So we have zeros. We already figured out their multiplicities were 9, 18, 18, 18, and 1 from the numerator. So like right there, the graph is hitting the undrawn uh, horizontal axis transversely. So this sort of thing you see in a calculus course typically, but otherwise the multiplicities are really large. So they're going through at like hyper, hyper, hyper inflection points. And this one has multiplicity nine and this one has, uh, so that's odd and it goes through and these are even. So I'm just putting this, I'm, I'm pointing out that we're not in an ivory tower here. This is not that far away from what we normally do with our students. So there's a horizontal asymptote here. You might recognize if you teach calculus and pre-calculus that normally our rational functions sort of don't obtain their asymptote visually so quickly. And that's because the tangency at infinity is not just of order one, but it's of order eight. That's what we worked out on the previous slide or I said on the previous slide. So we're sort of seeing that here. And then the green didn't come out so well, but we have four poles, all with this very high multiplicity, which means the function runs off to infinity very quickly, which is sort of why the gaps between the three humps is so large. And anyhow, this is a real variable visualization of our Bailey map beta. And um, there's also 56 non-critical pre-images of one, but we don't see anything, nothing else. There's nothing which is actually on this line at height one. And so all those must be non-real and they are, we'll see that on the next slide. And so I'm just sort of explaining how the ramification triple looks. All right, so I'm trying not to start too quickly. And all this is very much in the framework of Bellu maps. It's also in the framework of pre-calculus and calculus so far. All right, that real vi uh, variable visualization was a little bit just for fun. It's much more meaningful in Bellu maps to look at sort of complex variable visualizations. And the way you do this is you pick an interval downstairs. So I've picked sort of negative infinity, which is the same as infinity to zero. That's an interval in the downstairs line and I'm pulling it back upstairs. Our map has degree 64. 
And um, so you get 64 edges. So like, here are three of them, one, two, three. So if you have some experience with looking at descend on font, and you do from previous lectures, um, this looks more regular than a typical degree 64 belly map, right? I mean, normally things are all over the place. They're not so hovered around the, the real axis. Um, they're just generally less regular. So I would say this is a hint that this is a very unusual billy map. So just to sort of review things that are important in the context of this picture. So monodromy operators, we have one for each of the special points, zero, one, and infinity. They can be read off on the set of edges. So I imagine that some of this was talked about in previous talks, but I'll just say it again with this example. So G infinity, is to rotate counterclockwise minimally around a pre-image of infinity, which I've covered colored in green. So for example, let's look at this reference edge. If we hit it by G infinity, we go here, and then we go here, and then we go here, and it takes a while, but we get back here. And if you count these up, there's three here, and there's 13 here. So it gets back after 16 iterations. And here it's also like five plus 11, I guess. And here it's seven plus nine, and here it's one plus 15, but in each case it's 16. So that's the partition that we saw before, 16, 16, 16, 16. Same deal on the red. So this gives you G zero. So um, this, this edge would just be fixed if we spin it around its red end point. But these edges here would have an orbit of nine and the other ones would have an orbit of 18. And you know, this visualization is somewhat artificial because I'm treating G1 differently. And um, I won't go through the same identification of the monodromy operator, but in terms of the partition, the orbits of G1 correspond to the regions of the plane. So like here's a region in between two edges. And, um, sort of the contribution to the partition is half the bounding edges. So here there are two edges, divide that by two, it's a one. And if you looked at all the bounded regions, they're all bounded by two edges. So they're contributing one to the partition at one. But then there's the outside edge, which perfectly well counts because this is a picture in, P, uh, in a projective space. And the outside region rather is, has a lot of things. In fact, 16 edges bounding it. And so that gives us our contribution of eight. So each GI has a cycle type. I've kind of run through that. And then the previous slide was at the level of partitions, but you know, this slide is deeper. It's at the level of permutations. And you could run this on a computer. You could label your edges one through 64, or you could do something more theoretical. And these three elements, these three permutations really do generate all of S64. So that's our monodromy. All right, I, I'm going to be taking questions at the end of section one, but right now I think it's best if I just kind of barrel through section one. All right, so at the risk of ruining the software, ooh, that was bad, wasn't it? Um, going way back to here, I wrote down what this Bellu map is, but how could you get this Bellu map by like standard belly map computational techniques. So that's what I'm gonna go through now. Computation of beta. So there are other ways. This is in fact, not the way I discovered this belly map. So to obtain beta, you can first consider something of its general shape. So you get to normalize. And so, you know, I've chosen y equals minus two and y equals two and it's not so clear, but also y equals infinity as special points, that exhaust normalizations. And otherwise I've kept all coefficients free. So there are seven equations in seven unknowns. The knowns are visible, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. And the equations are, we want the difference of the numerator and the denominator to not just be degree 63, we want it to have degree 56. So you can set those up. Um, you can solve by Gribner basis techniques. This is not a computational challenge with modern software. So it turns out there are 35 solutions. 
And so the way this theory works is they correspond to 35 separate Bell maps. So all this is sort of over C. And when you bring in the standard arithmetic to Bell maps, you know that, that, well, let's focus on A, which I will, we'll be doing in just a second. You know that there's 35, except for maybe coincidences, which rarely happen, 35 different A's, and, um, but there's some arithmetic here because they satisfy a degree 35 polynomial with coefficients in Q. I mean, if you think about how the Gribner basis thing would work, you would never see any larger fields. So they satisfy a degree 35 polynomial. So generically, you would expect this polynomial to be irreducible. But this is what we get. And now we're starting to see the specialness of this particular Bell map. So this degree 35 polynomial factors, and one of the roots is zero. And all the other ones are as tied up as they normally are. So this zero is not from some dumb symmetry that I'm not telling you. This is an unexpected zero you would not expect that this polynomial would factor as 34 plus one as it does. So the first factor, just the A, gives our particular beta, and the remaining unknowns are then easily determined, and there they are. And the second factor is pretty bad. So it's not even close to further factoring. Its Galois group is S34. And it's discriminant. Well, people used to get excited about this. I suppose I still do. People would say, oh, wow, it's field discriminant is divisible by only small primes. It's like only the primes less than 64 and not even all of those. So that's pretty exciting. That's sort of a theorem implicit in growth indeed proved by Beckman much, many years later. Um, but to me, this is not such a good example, the other 34, because that's still a lot of primes. <laughs> The one that splits off is going to be ramified at two and three only. So that's, again, you can see something much, much more special about the one that splits off. All right, so now I wanna talk about general Bell U maps, but still be using this example, um, still be using this particular Bell U map as an example. So here are three invariants of a degree N Bell U map. So this is the big three I mentioned on my overview slide. So there's the monodromic group. It's some subgroup of SN. It's how the edges are permuted. So for our particular beta, as I said, it's all of S64. And this is not exciting. Um, just a random Bell U map would probably have monodromic group all of S64. And I'm gonna use the word full to mean as big as possible or almost as big as possible, either S, SN or AN. So like our particular one is full. All right, the second of the big three is the field of definition. So like for the other 34 that we just looked at, it's some degree 34 field embedded into C. But for ours, it's Q. And this is despite the fact that this, this particular Bell U map sort of has companions. So a priori, you would not expect it to be defined over Q, but it is. So like these, this triple is the main thing in what uh, sometimes called a passport. So I think John and Sam talked about this. So when the degree, <clears throat> when the degree of sort of the partitions which define everything is large, like it is 35 in this case, very commonly, and you see this on the sort of the database and the LMFDB, all the corresponding Bell U maps are conjugate. And that's not happening here. It's a one plus 35. So then there's the bad reduction set. So for beta, as I hinted at, it's just two, three. So you can see this by computing some the discriminant and factoring it. But another way to see it is just look at what I wrote on the previous slide and interpret the numerator and denominator in FP of Y. So you'll see that for two and three, there's some degeneracies in the roots, but otherwise there's no degeneracies in the roots at all. And that's the same thing as saying it has good reduction. So in general, this set, which I'm gonna call script P 
is a subset of the primes dividing the, the order of the mononeuroma group. That's this theorem of growth and deke from way back when. Um, and so when it's SN, the bound is like all the primes less than or equal to your degree. And typically, which is not what's happening for our example, the set of bad primes is close to, or I would say generically in my experience, it's equal to its upper bound. All right, I think I'm done. Yes, I am. I'm done with section one, where that was not a, a standard overview of belly maps, but it was sort of, sort of a, a review of some of the ideas of belly maps in a context that, that's going to be good for us. So I think I could take a question or two from anybody. Uh, there's a quick question in the chat. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not really saying. No, 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 that's fine. Let me, I'll just read it for you. It's from Allison Miller. Um, does this Bailey map have an entry in the LMFDB? And then uh, Sam said that no, only degree up to nine. Okay, so, but maybe I could answer that more broadly. So currently the LMFDB is focused on exhaustively doing all degree, low degrees. I mean, that's sort of true for many aspects of the belly of the LMFDB, but it's true for the belly map section. And that's great. Um, I'm sort of looking in this talk at a different regime. So we're in a situation where exhaustive tabulation is completely impossible. We're into like trillions, I'll be making that point, of belly maps. And so I'm in the sort of the framework of picking out particularly interesting belly maps. Another quick question. Uh, Dave, I have one quick question. Um, right. So is there is there some hint that that this uh, passport is going to split and have more than one orbit from is there any any hint of that from anything any other considerations? So in brief, no, but a part of the answer which is yes is I have this in a two parameter family and it splits always in a two parameter family although this is the only member of this family where the bad reduction is within two and three. So I have this pretty amazing two parameter family, and this is a member of that family. But do I understand on some conceptual level why this two parameter family splits? Basically, no. That's an interesting problem. All right, let's move to section two. So no Hurwitz stuff yet, but I want to make a general conjecture. And I don't really like to do this, but I think maybe the best way to communicate it is go down my own personal memory lane. I hope you'll indulge me. So here's a personal timeline of how I got into this. So in 2004 and 2005, so Gunter Mala, who I knew at that time only by email, and I tried to find, and this is the big three again, full ANRSN belly maps defined over Q and ramified within two, three for as many degrees as possible. So we found that, well, we knew some already in low degrees there, that's exhaustively treated. But then when you move up to larger degrees, well, there was an obvious one in degree nine coming from trinomials, but we found another one in degree nine and one in degree 10, and I think several in degree 12, and one in degree 18, one in degree 28, and one in degree 33. And um, in degree nine and 10, this computation was pretty close to exhaustive, didn't find too much. And it definitely was not exhaustive in larger degrees, but we tried as hard as we could. And, and, and Mala at this time was, I think the, the clear leader in computations of belly maps. And my secret reason for collaborating with him was to learn his techniques that was successful. And, um, and, and so it's not like there's tons more in degree nine that we're missing. So in the back of our minds, we're thinking like, maybe we found like, maybe, maybe the degree 33 one is the last one or much more likely at least this list, whatever the complete list is, it's finite. These run out. That's the type of thing that we were thinking. And just by the way, all this re is related to number fields. And if you, if you look at the paper, I have all the references piled up at the end. Um, you'll see that it more focuses on number fields. All right, so then a little bit later, 
um, I built some unusual rational functions. And actually, Sam, I'm glad you asked this question because these are the exact rational functions that I'm talking about. I built them from Chebyshev polynomials. They have very easy formulas. And so there's one of them, T89 of degree 36. And then the one from section one was U89 of degree 64. So the list with Mala at least extends by two elements. So now I'm sort of a stubborn person in some ways. Now I'm thinking, maybe now I got them all. <laughs> I mean, that's very optimistic. I can see Rachel smiling. It's appropriate to smile. Um, but you know, we looked pretty hard. I've looked for 12 years since I found no more. Uh, so maybe now I have them all. But somewhat more seriously, the same year, but in a different work, uh, I realized that, that Manjul Bhargava's heuristic on the number of number fields with a given discriminant, if you really literally interpret the heuristic as being like a theorem, and so you can take asymptotes any which way you want, asymptotics any which way you want, that would say that there should only be finitely many full Bailey maps, the big three again, finitely many full Bailey maps defined over Q and ramified with a given finite set of primes. So this heuristic would say that, okay, no assertion that we have all of them from this blue list, but the list should run out. So that's kind of what I believed in 2008. So then in 2012, Akshay Venkatesh came up to me at one of the joint meetings and I did not know him then. He introduced himself politely to me and he was very polite, but in the second sentence, he said, quote, I think your conjecture is wrong. So <laughs> that's not something that one normally likes to hear, but um, it was very polite and we talked some more and, um, after about 10 or 15 minutes, I was pretty convinced my conjecture was wrong. So we worked pretty hard together. Uh, I sort of have the complete set of something like 250 emails back and forth on this. And we worked out what we think is right. So we worked out how Bailey maps constructed from specializing Hurwitz covers. That's why Akshay thought that my conjecture was wrong. They just, they just completely escaped this bark of a heuristic. So in particular, they almost definitely render the, the, the statement here false for some P. So some of these lists should go on forever. All right, section two is pretty short. Um, I'm going to ask for questions when I'm done with section two. So this slide you can interpret in isolation. And if you interpret it in isolation, it's weird. You ready? So definition. Let's call a finite set of primes, P, an abelian if it contains the set of primes dividing the order of a finite non-abelian simple group and abelian otherwise. So this is a pretty weird definition. For starters, the knots are in strange places. So let's unpack this definition. So examples. The set P equals two, three, and then some other prime. It's anabelian, at least for P in five, seven, 13, and 17, because of the following simple groups. So maybe we can start with A5. So A5, it has order 60. So that factors is T squared three, five, and moving all up, A5 is a finite non-abelian simple group. And the set of primes dividing its order is two, three, fives. And that makes the set two, three, five and abelian. That's how I'm using language. And if you had a very strange education and you never saw a five, but if you saw a six, then you would have the same conclusion that two, three, five is an anabelian set of primes. And then, you know, sort of if you run through the, the sort of the small finite non abelian simple groups. Um, this one's the next one, and the primes dividing it are two, three, seven. And so that makes two, three, seven non abelian, an abelian. And then slightly more exotic groups, you can get two, three, 13, and two, three, 17. And then um, I'm clicking the advanced button on my computer, and I'm advancing, you know, four decades and much <laughs> more in sophistication. So all other primes, sets of primes, 
of size three or less are abelian by the classification of finite simple groups. So like there's no finite simple group of order two to a power, three to a power, 11 to a power. Some of this was known, like certainly all sets of primes with just two elements are abelian. That was Burnside's theorem way back when. But if you move up to three primes, then you're using most of the power of the full classifications to assert that. And then just as another example, if we leave two out, and so we look at a set like three, five, seven, 11, 13, um, that would be abelian because all finite non-abelian simple groups have even order, right? That's the thing which set off the classification, the fight Thompson theory. All right, so this is a weird distinction. Certainly the language is weird, right? But now let's go to the refined expectations. So to repeat, Akshay told me I was wrong. Very rapidly, I was pretty convinced that he was indeed right. Uh, after our work together, I'm utterly convinced that he was right. So what is the right thing? So we have this conjecture. So let P be an anabelian set of primes. So just to review, like 235 or 237. Then there exist full Bellu maps. This is the big three again defined over Q and ramified within P of arbitrarily large degree. So just translating like you might for a calculus student, if you give me two, three, five and say, is there such a Bellu map of degree above a million? I say, yes. If you say degree above a billion, I say, yes. If you say degree above a trillion, I say, yes. But note, if you say degree between a billion and a trillion, I don't know a priori from what's stated here. So in fact, the reason that we think this is true is the existence of Hurwitz Bellu maps. And these are really, really sparse. So yes, I'm pretty sure there's one between degree a billion and a trillion. But if you ask me for one between 10 billion and 20 billion, maybe not, okay, they're very sparse. That's a very, very strong reason for believing this conjecture. This is in the category of conjecture um, that the right expert with the right you know, amount of time, I'm pretty sure could prove uh, this conjecture. All right, I wanna complement this with a stubborn personal guess. So let P be an abelian set of primes. So like the ones I mentioned on the previous slide. Then there exists full Bellu maps defined over Q and ramified within P, the big three again, only for finitely many degrees N. So like one weak reason for believing this is the good examples that we do have seem very accidental. Like again, I'm glad Sam asked his question. That Chebyshev example is very accidental. I've tried to modify it in all sorts of ways and I'm just left with my two parameter family and that's it. And so another reason for believing this is maybe there's some validity for the Bargavli heuristic in this sort of vertical direction. So anyhow, that's my personal guess. But I, I think you realize there's a lot of open problems on this slide. You could try to prove the conjecture. You could try to prove the personal guess. That would require ideas that I, I are completely beyond me, new ideas. You could try to disprove the personal guess. That would be, I'd be very interested in that. Um, you could try to beat records like 64, that degree 64 thing. Go for it. Try to find one which is bigger than 64. Okay, so there's lots of open problems here. All right, that ends my section two. I think I'm on track time wise, so don't be shy. I'd be um, happy to answer some questions. Uh, did you leave off disproving the conjecture for any reason? So. <laughs> Thank you. Was that a question or just like, yeah. So go, go for it, disprove the conjecture. But in the world of conjectures, like we all assign probabilities to like the Riemann hypothesis or something. And I think some people secretly think 99.9% .9 and some people, and then they're much more secretive about that, think a higher number. So I think this is something where everything, this is not like that. This is like seriously, in the 99.9999999% situation. So yes, I left that off for a reason. There might be some graduate students here. I tried to point you in three promising directions. 
pointing you in an unpromising direction, I think that's not really good sportsmanship. So thanks, Rachel. Um, that was a good question. Any other question? Oh, well, there's, there's one in the chat. Um, okay, again, if you could read that. Yeah. Is there an explanation for the relation between existence of large debris and the abelian non abelian condition on the set of primes? That's from Ariel? Yes, absolutely, Ariel. So um, I've tried to isolate the conjecture so it make, makes no reference to Hurwitz maps, Hurwitz covers. But the only reason we believe the conjecture is because of the existence of what I'm gonna talk about in section three. And as like a combinatorial input for a Hurwitz map, you need a group. And the ones that give covers, which correspond to the conjectures are either simple groups or things very closely related to simple groups like SN. So that's the reason. So remember my old personal guess was this held uniform, universally. And the new guess is there are definitely these exceptions from Hurwitz Bellu maps, but like, my real new personal guess is maybe those are the only exceptions. So yes, the reason that Anabelian comes in is you need a group to define a Hurwitz value map. Okay, that's a great preview for section three. All right, section three. So um, looking back on, on, on lectures one through five, not much prepared you for this section. So I think some of you with certain backgrounds are like totally gonna to eat up this section, but others of, of you, I'm, I'm encouraging you to maybe interpret this at some formal level and I'll try to help you along with that. So I'm just saying I'm gonna go a bit fast and furious at times. All right, so let's consider again, a general degree N map. So maybe many critical values, not just three. But we can again look at Bellier type invariants. It still makes sense to talk about the monodroma group, which I'm gonna call G. It still makes sense to look at the conjugacy classes underlying ramification. So maybe I'll explain this a little bit. You're supposed to think of P1 downstairs. Maybe you can look at my hands now, if you can see me. P1 downstairs, so that's, you know, maybe I'll think of it as a sheet. And then upstairs, we have a multi-sheeted thing but uh, John and Sam had a really lovely picture where the sheets are intertwining. That's what we're talking about for global monodromy. But there's places where they intertwine, points above critical values downstairs. And those are governed, if you sort of go around such a critical value, you get a, a permutation in your group, and that's a local monodromy operator. And that's sort of base point dependent. And if you want something which doesn't depend on anything, it's a class, a conjugacy class. So that's what this is. And then remember, we're starting with a map here. So you can, you can say, what are the critical values? And what critical values correspond to what classes? So those will all be divisors. That's why I'm using D in the downstairs projective line. And um, so that's part of the information that you have associated with an F. So to obtain a single discrete invariant, well, G, a finite group is already discrete and a class and a group is discrete, but there's some continuity in here because you know divisors can move. So to obtain a single discrete invariant, we'll just take the degree of these divisors and call them mu. And um, so then we have a vector of degrees. So we then form what's called the Hurwitz parameter. So for those of you for whom all this is new, I put the Hurwitz parameter in orange. So like the lowest level you can be thinking is Hurwitz parameters are combinatorial data. They're not so hard in themselves and they arise as discrete variants of maps. And to help you understand this more, it's important to add up all these mu's to get the total number of critical values, that's R. And actually the case R equals three, that's what Bell maps is all about. So then our multiplicity would be one, one, one. And then our divisors would not look like general divisors. One of them would be the divisor zero, the other divisor one, the other the divisor infinity. And what I'm going to do in this section three is extract particularly interesting Bell maps from the cases are greater than or equal to four. 
So what you should be thinking is, there's all sorts of maps. And the most extreme are the belly maps. But what about things that were like sub-extreme? Like maybe they have four critical values or sub-sub-extreme, like five critical values. That's what we're doing. So all this is connected up with Hurwitz maps or Hurwitz covers. So an R point Hurwitz parameter, still in orange to have you focus on it, determines a cover of R dimensional complex varieties. So for concreteness, instead of saying R, I think I'm gonna say 10. So you're supposed to think of this as let's say a 10 dimensional variety. It's called configuration space. People in topology and physics and things like that are interested in configuration spaces. And this thing is a Hurwitz space. And what are these things? So a point X in this Hurwitz space is indexing an isomorphism class of covers having these discrete invariants. So a Hurwitz space is a somewhat sophisticated moduli space. It's like an MG, but there's more data that goes involved. It's like the moduli of genus G curves, but it's, it's just a more int intricate thing. So that's what this Hurwitz space is. And the base space, configuration space, is the space of possible branch loci. So if you have a map, you can just look at its set of critical values and keep track of, of sort of what classes they belong to. And, and that would be something in your configuration space. And the map from Hurwitz space to configuration space sends a cover to its branch locus. It's like, forget some information. It's what covering maps normally are. So I, I warned you I'm going fast, but I'm, I'm trying to have you think intuitively about this thing. So maybe this is a 10 dimensional space, then this would definitely be a 10 dimensional space, like it's an unramified cover. So the first thing to ask is what's the degree? So there's a general formula with a main term and secondary terms. Uh, in Bellu maps, you're, you're used to an instance of this formula, but the same formula applies. And if you have enough classes, all the secondary terms go away and the formula becomes exact. And here it is. So, um, so like if this were 10 dimensional, we might have, let's say 10 separate classes. That would be if all the news were one. Each of those would have a certain size, 30, 48, you know, 108, whatever, depending on the group. Multiply all those numbers together, divide by the square of the order of the group, you're gonna get a big number. So like things to think about is maybe this is a 10 dimensional space that forces this to be a 10 dimensional space. And maybe the map between them is, you know, a quadrillion degree quadrillion map. That's the type of ballpark that we're in. All right, so here are some known facts about Herbert's maps. I'm running through the big three again, monodromy. So this is where the theorem of Venkatesh comes in. So the main theorem that I proved with Akshay gives necessary and sufficient conditions on a pair like this. So this is like two thirds of a Hurwitz parameter for, for this map to have full monodromy. That means monodromy either AN or SN for sufficiently large um, multiplicities. So this is like a weakness in our proof. The actual proof is some asymptotic thing, but the expectation is borne out by lots of computations that when all the news are one, you still have full monodromy. So we can only prove it in the limit, which is enough for the conjecture that I asserted, uh, but we think that much, much, much stronger things hold. That's monodromy. So in particular, any simple non-abelian G like A5, gives rise to full Hurwitz maps of arbitrarily large degree. You can just pick a couple conjugate classes. You could just pick one and just increase your multiplicities. Field of definition. This is the most abstract nonsense of these. So if all the CIs are rational, it makes sense for a class and a group to be rational, then, um, then this cover is defined over Q. There's sort of no irrational data involved anywhere. And for those of you who haven't seen this, if you're thinking in the group SN, which is interesting here, 
and then all the classes are rational. And for general G, if the class you're interested in consists of involutions, order two element, then it's rational too. So this is the least of our worries. Bad reduction. This is also like a no worry situation. So pi H has all its bad reduction within the set PG of primes dividing G. And, um, and this is because the moduli problem that is solved here makes sense. Well, it makes sense for general G, but its solution doesn't general space schemes. But if the if P is invertible on the base scheme, it's solved in the same way. This is a very common thing in this sort of area of math. So if we were talking about Hurwitz maps, we have the big three. These are earlier, and this is a newer result. All right, so Bellie pencil. So a problem is that we have this degree 10 base. This is my worst slide. So we have this deg degree 10 base. And if we wanna get a Bellie map, we need to take a one parameter slice of it. So we can't just take any one parameter slice. We have to stick P1 in there so that zero, one and infinity sort of run into the boundary of configuration space. That would be a different way of seeing that. So here I have some, it's hard to sort of wrap your mind around this, uh, but I'll give you a, 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 I'll try. So, so configuration space three, one, that means spaces of divisors of order three and divisors of order one. Well, what if I picked the number J and took the divisors here to, um, to get an order three divisor as the root of this polynomial. And then I just take infinity. Do you see how that would be a family of, of degree four divisors depending on a parameter J? That's basically what a Bellu pencil is. And I noticed in looking over the slides from my previous speakers that up to maybe change of coordinates, three of the speakers talked about that exact Bellu map. That's the, pic, the, the picture that John and Sam have. Um, you know, is about that exact belly map. And then I think Oslam in the context of iterating it was looking at, at this too after changing coordinates. So these things have their own polynomial discriminants and they have their own bad reduction sets. Um, and so this is all pretty easy. Getting belly pencils is not the issue. All right, now finally, let me go a little bit more slowly. What is a Hurwitz belly map? The basic idea is to take the magic of Herbert's maps and move them over to Bellu maps. So suppose given a Herbert's parameter put in orange as before and a Bellu pencil. So then we can look at this pretty standard diagram. So we have this miraculous Herbert's cover, the thing in orange. We have a one parameter slice of the huge base. And so we just pull back. And so we have a, a cover. So now this is a cover of one dimensional things. It's less, <laughs> I mean, like this is really interesting. It would be a decent perspective that this is less interesting. But if you're only interested in Bellu maps then this is too big for you. And so now we're down here. And to make it really a Bellu map you have to complete. So it's a complete curve, but you know, it's curved. We have canonical completion. So that's the Bellu map. It depends on a choice of Hurwitz cover and a, a choice of a Bellu pencil. So if H and U are defined over Q, which is absolutely no problem, then this Bellu map is rational. So each of the contributors, the Bellu map and the Hurwitz pencil could contribute bad primes, but neither one of these is a problem at all. And so we have complete control over, in the sense of upper bounds, of the bad reduction set of this Hurwitz Bellu map. And we should have pretty good control over monodromy groups as well, because these things are almost always full. Whoopsie. The Hurwitz things, by this theorem with Venkatesh, are almost always full with the right hypothesis. And Normally in algebraic geometry, when you take a slice of something, fundamental groups do not drop. I mean, they could, a priori they could, but that's like against algebraic geometric principles. So it's a priori possible that the monogromy group becomes smaller. 
So your job, if you want to prove the conjecture, is to say that just in some non-vanishing percentage of cases, they don't become smaller. So getting back to your question, Rachel, I expect like finding examples where they become smaller is like impossible. Uh, my expectation is they never become smaller. And, and what you need to prove is they, you know, almost at least sometimes they never, at least infinitely many times they never become small. All right, I'm almost done with the whole lecture, except we're in a really curious place. The, um, my title slide is Hurwitz belly maps. And I've shown you one belly map, the initial one, and it wasn't a Hurwitz belly map. So this is against my philosophies of, you know, examples everywhere. So I wanna sort of conclude by showing you what belly maps, what Hurwitz belly maps actually look like. So I'm gonna put them in a uniform context presented by a bivariate equation relating J and X. So J, which I'm saying, cause it's sort of related to the J invariant for elliptic curves, that's the coordinate on the base. So like here's one. So this is my Hurwitz parameter. And this is a belly pencil from the previous slide. And this is sort of capturing the fiber above zero and the fiber above infinity. And you know, we could set this equal to zero and solve for J. And this would be a degree 32 map. And we could take the discriminant of this and it would sort of factor. And so there we have it. I mean, we know a priori that it will factor, but it actually factors in the way that we expect. And so that's a Hurwitz belly map. So I'm trying to put this in the context of belly map. So I've done this with John and Sam. I've sent them partitions and their software in this range works. So if they wanted to, they could get all 16 maps, about 16, um, with this triple. And one of them would be this one. All right, let's move on up. Let's change the parameter in the, the group in the Hurwitz parameter to A6 rather than A5. And let's have a five point thing. Each of those is a pretty vast increase in complexity. Um, I made this simpler. But anyhow, the degree went up to 192. Computations are feasible. So like one of the pleasures of Bellu maps is you write this down, you, you, you solve equations or whatever to write this down, and then you take the discriminant, and this is a degree 15,000 polynomial, uh, 15, uh, uh, an integer with 15,000 digits. It's not normally a good idea to try to factor that, but it factors like that. One of the pleasures I, I see, William. I can. I, you're 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 very prominent in my uh, in my field of view, and if I can say so, you've been looking morose for an hour, and that's been disturbing me. And uh, <laughs> I'm glad I got a smile out of you. Okay, so if you look at the math formula, this is one of about a decillion. I looked up that word for this talk full belly maps with this particular ramification triple. So John and Sam and your group, don't expect an email from me. You're not gonna be able to compute all of them. You might be able to compute one of them. But anyhow, going back to what we were saying before, I really want you to come away from this talk with Hurwitz belly maps are very special. The most extreme thing I think is very likely, maybe all the other ones are all conjugate. And all of them have bad reduction at all primes less than 192. And this one alone splits off and has bad reduction at two, three, and five. Now, maybe that's not right. Maybe it's not that extreme, but something along those lines is certainly what I expect happens. Okay, I just wanna show you that you can do this with two, three, seven. It's harder, you have to have more exotic groups. You can't use A5 or A6, but it's definitely within the realm of possibility. Um, so this is uh, sort of just another example with larger degree. And I did wanna remind you that we're very much in the framework of Bellu maps. So all these things have attractive pictures. Um, I just drew this one, so that's a descend. And again, this particular Hurwitz belly map, as you can see, I'm really trying hard to hit this point, 
is one of many, but I think it's the best one by far of the many. All right, and this last slide just repeats things that I've said. So unlike the parallel assertion about number fields, which is actually what Aksha and I conjecture, this conjecture predicting unbounded degrees may be provable by braid monodromy arguments. So arithmetic or algebra is just not necessary at all. Like those equations that I fought pretty hard to get, they are not needed. This is a topological group theoretical assertion. And you can compute topologically and see that this is right in degrees way beyond what I've computed. And just to repeat, what's needed to prove the conjecture, which Rachel, that's the most interesting, well, not the most interesting, but I think the most tractable of the open problems that I'm posing. What's needed to prove the conjecture is theoretical control over the potential drop in monodromy when one passes from the high dimensional Herbert's cover to the one dimensional Bellu slice of it. All right, I put up my slides. If you're interested in this, um, I put up, I mean, I'm putting my references in my slides. If you're interested in this, the papers that in some ways I'm referring to, many of them are on my homepage. And then of course, there's other very relevant papers that you can find. I do wanna maybe point out this one. So if you'd like to sort of like read the written version of this, approximately speaking, it's this one paper, Hurwitz Belly Map. So the same title as the talk. And um, it explains everything I've said sort of in more details without requiring that you track down other things. Okay, so that completes my talk. Um, if there's more questions, I'd be glad to take some. Thank you.